You know, as we kick off this sermon series, I'd like to invite you to turn to Matthew chapter 1. And when I think about that word hope, I think really in so many ways, uh, the very word that describes the desire of our hearts. Uh, those questions that uh, the first century Jewish people asked are no different than the questions we ask today. And that is, God, is there hope for my life? And we know that God, from the beginning of time until the moment of Christmas, was faithful to give us his son and to give us what the true hope of our hearts really is all about. Um, as you're finding, I want to read, as you're finding your place in Matthew chapter 1 and verse 18, I want to read through the story, and here's why. Because sometimes we read it, and if we're raised in church, we think, well, I've already heard this, or I know it. And in some ways, that is my problem. I have heard it, and I have seen it. Uh, we have a lot of pastors who are part of our church that have retired, and some who are uh, teachers and still can continue to communicate. And every pastor and minister would tell you that after so many years, you always think about creative ways to tell the Christmas story, but it's not always easy to do that. And it just kind of dawned on me this week, you know how I'm going to start off the whole series? I'm going to say there's something about a virgin birth, God becoming man, that's really pretty creative and amazing and as relevant today as it was then, and if that's not good enough for people, I don't know what to tell them. So as you find your place in verse 18, we're going to capture the moment when God gave to us his son in human flesh. Verse 18 in Matthew 1, this is how the birth of the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. And when Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. But he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. He gave him the name Jesus. Dear Heavenly Father, just for a moment as we gather around your word, I pray that for those who are close and are far away, that we would hear your voice through your word. Somehow allow us to just step back and to consider the way in which you brought your son, the way in which you demonstrate your love towards us, and the very promise that we have in claiming that you have given to us even today. You know how many heartaches are probably represented in the seats today. Lord, all of us feel some measure of brokenness or longing. And in Christmas time, that particular longing can be accentuated. We can feel it all the more. And yet as believers, you've, you've really given us exactly what we need on this side of heaven to be your people, to walk together. Today as a church family, we open up our hearts to you and pray that you take your word from the page and you would apply it to our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Advent is the coming of the Lord, both the first time he arrived and then yet a time in which he will come again. But in that first coming, that promise that God had given his people that there would be a Messiah, something beautiful takes place. And I want to go ahead, if you have your outline, to give this to you in big thoughts ahead of time, even now, and you can write this down in your guide, and that is, in one sense, when we think about the Christmas story, Christ was born in an ordinary world. Uh, there were a lot of ordinary, natural things uh, that would have surprised nobody in the way Jesus came to us and that world that was there in the first century. But on the other hand, he came to us in a very extraordinary way. He was born in an ordinary world that was broken, that was longing, that was messed up, None of us have to read the news or watch it or click the latest post to know that our world is full of sin and needs Jesus. We know that in our own personal walk, in our own marriages, our own families, our own churches, we need Jesus. And the promise that God had given to his people 
was that he was going to send them that Messiah. The amazing thing is, whenever you walk through these first 17 verses, you find that God, although he's right on time, we get a little worried about him. He seems to take his time. And you go from verse 1, notice the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David and of Abraham, that from that moment all the way throughout history, God was bringing people to a perfect position of needing him. God knew exactly when he wanted to bring his son into the world, and that's exactly what he did on that and in that way. But notice with me in just these first couple of verses, verses 18 to 19, in the middle of this genealogy, why all of that makes sense. He was born in this ordinary world, and Matthew is writing to Jewish, to Jewish believers or to those Jewish people who are yet to believe in a way to connect for them how they would understand the coming or the hope that would be found in the Messiah. Everyone knew there were certain things that had to be true about this Messiah. He would have to be within the lineage or the line of Abraham, the father of our faith, the covenant that God made with him from Genesis 12, that he reinstated with David and on through the line. Uh, The Jewish people were very aware of who they were related to. Uh, They were literally walking ancestry.coms. They knew who their grandparents were, who their great-grandparents were, and their great-great-grandparents Uh, They already had prayed for those who would come after them. Think about that. Today, you're fortunate if you know who your great-grandparents are. Maybe some of us here know our great-great-grandparents, but beyond 100 years or so, most of us are in pretty good company that we can't really see beyond that. That wasn't the case for the Jewish people. Who you were related to and how you were related to them was a very part of their religious faith. So we find in this ordinary lineage that the focus of the Christmas story slows down, zooms in then on two people, Joseph and Mary. They are both right in this perfect line. You find that word birth from which we get the idea of a genealogy, and that's why this genealogical account was so important. We read through it in the Old Testament, and sometimes you just get this thought of, Lord, what is it with all of these names? And we might even say to ourselves, well, there's not much of a lesson there. Maybe there's not much to take away. Let us just be reminded that God works with real people and in real time. Every name that is mentioned has a story. Every one of those people needed a savior, and God was working out his story in their lives. Joseph did nothing to deserve where he was in this moment, neither did Mary, but they were both Jewish. Joseph, rightly related to the people of God, the Jewish people, We find it here in Matthew 1. And then Mary, we find her account over in Luke. That's why the Bible slows down and pauses. It says here you have a big view of everyone they were related to, back to the the first fathers of our faith, and now look at them. This young couple are about ready to shine on the stage of Christmas, and they had no earthly idea. We know they were not only Jewish, but they were actually very righteous people. Now, when I say righteous, you know, when we think of that word in the New Testament, we're thinking of those who are righteous because they put their faith in Christ. We are righteous through the cross. But for the Old Testament believers, they were looking to God. Ultimately, everything they looked to in God was fulfilled in Jesus. But the law was very important to them in living out what it was uh, and what it meant to be righteous. They weren't saved by the law. The Bible says Abraham was saved by faith. But you knew you were doing what God wanted you to do when you obeyed the law. Notice what the Bible says about Joseph. He was what? Faithful to the law. Did you see that in verse 19? Uh, This was a good man in the ordinary sense of the word. Uh, Much more than that, he was a religious man, a God-fearer. He was somebody who was following God and feared God. How do I know that as well? Because we'll see in just a moment his great character by the way he treated Mary at a time when their life was completely unhinged and and hindered and interrupted. But for now, we know that this is just a man named Joseph. He's Jewish. He's keeping the law. And one other thing, he's engaged to Mary. Mary is a woman, I believe, of great character. How do I know that? We get more of her story in Luke than we do Matthew. But the Bible says that when Gabriel announced to her that she was going to literally conceive God's son, that she said what? Let your will be done. Let your will be done. Be glorified in my life for your humble servant. Thank you for considering my humble estate. There's a sense of humility here. 
Now, they were in need of a savior. We make a mistake when we think like Joseph and Mary were so good uh, that somehow they didn't need Jesus. The Bible does not teach that. All have fallen short of the glory of God. Every person has sinned, including Joseph, including Mary. But we do thank God that these were people that were oriented towards God in a good way. Their hearts were turned towards him in the right way. I don't think Jesus would let I don't think God would let Jesus be born and raised in a home where people were headed to, to prison, okay? I'm speaking personally here. Some of my family tree have experienced that. I'm just saying that to you. But on the other hand, but on the other hand, they were good, they were responsive to the faith, but they needed Jesus. It's an ordinary world. But what do you do with this interruption? Notice the Bible says here from the text, verse 18, she was conceived through what church family? The Holy Spirit. Like, what does this mean? And for them, they were as confounded with that in that time, much more so than we could ever imagine, because here's what we need to know about a Jewish wedding. Unlike today, when we get married, it's it's not good. Hope you haven't been to many of them. But up until the moment that the ceremony takes place, that groom, that bride can kind of bail, and that's okay. You know, you're just, it's a little awkward, but you can do that. It's not a sin, in other words. Now, if you say, I do, and then you bail, now that's a different story. That's a sin. But up until that moment, you can literally kind of get out of this deal before it's made, this commitment before God. I attended a wedding one time, and I was standing there, what they call the vestibule, and there was the groom, and he was about ready to walk in. His beautiful bride was on the other side of the room, and the groom's dad yelled out just before the music started, it's not too late, son. I thought, no. Those were some fantastic wedding photos, I could tell you. I've never seen a groom look so sad in all of my life. And yet when I thought about that, I thought, you know, up until that moment, they're not sinning. You could do that. But that was different in this day and age. Uh, When you were engaged, you were at the moment of the the commitment between families and the, and the, the fiancé. Uh, the groom, the potential bride, to the extent that if one of them were to actually have a relationship with somebody else, uh, they would be guilty of adultery and that could be punished by death. Uh, The stakes were much higher. In other words, they were as good as married, but the ceremony was to follow. But the thing, though, the Bible says over and again is that this was from the Spirit. Read over verse 25. Joseph had yet to touch Mary. We know the Bible says that she was a virgin. And so here is the story of their lives. Like every young couple with every desire and every heart, they're about ready to get married. And she has to say to Joseph, and Joseph has to become aware of what God was doing through an angel just like Mary. You're pregnant. Uh, She's not making this up. But God has done this. God had done this. This was a miracle. You read through the Old Testament, you're a student of God's word, you know there were many people who wanted to get pregnant but could not. Mary was never looking to get pregnant in this moment and winds up pregnant. It's almost like from Abraham, you find Sarah unable to conceive. What did God do? He came through, 100 years old. That's what Abraham was. They have Isaac. Sarah was at the young age of 90. Think about this. They have a baby. Why? Because God said, I want, I want to take credit for this and do this in such a way that man would know I'm working. But yet it was natural that it was a husband and a wife. And it was a foreshadowing, I believe, of God doing the greatest act of intervention. We find the same thing repeated in Isaac and Rebecca's life. You go through and you find it in the life of Samuel's mother. She prayed for a little baby. You find a hand of there before God. I love that story because she just wanted to be a mother and God listened to her, gave her a child. But listen, all of that came in a way that was completely natural. But listen to this. This was unlike anything else because God did this and there was no human way in which man could take credit for the very nature or pass on the sin nature, the DNA that has plagued us since Adam. See, all of that's important. And that's what's going on in this moment. But I pause to consider a few other things. Joseph and Mary, although they were engaged, did not have a lot of money. How do we know that? Because they gave the 
uh, the lesser of the sacrifices they could have given whenever they dedicated Jesus at the temple. They were normal in the sense of peasants. As Max Lucado says, every cul-de-sac had a Joseph living in a house. Mary's name was not, uh, was not uncommon, even the name of Jesus. God saves, the Lord saves was not uncommon. We just finished a series of Joshua, meaning in the Hebrew, the Lord saves, another pointer to the person of the work of Jesus. Nothing was uncommon about it. It was a very ordinary world. People were plagued by the Roman oppression. The Jewish people at this time in history had come out of the Maccabean era, that time for which the Jewish people uh, were leading revolts against the oppression of those who were trying to snuff out their religion, ridicule their religion. But in that darkness of some 400 years between Malachi and Matthew, God is working. And he worked in this ordinary way. You think about this. God could have sent Jesus in a lot of ways. It would have made perfect sense, wouldn't it? If God would have just kind of parachuted Jesus down and he was fully man and he was armed and he had an army behind him, that would have made perfect sense for the way that we think. Might, physical strength, tactics. And yet God does none of that. He gives us himself through the most fragile of moments and ways, a mother and her baby. And when you have a child, there's something in your heart that you can never love more. And there's nothing that we know in our heart that we have completely within us to raise that child and to love it on our own. We need the help of God. We need his touch. That's the fragile nature of having children. But this just isn't any children. This is Jesus. So there's Mary, likely a teenager. There's Joseph, just a carpenter. And there they are. The very ordinary world in which God had arranged was about ready to be upended through his power. I want you to come to this other part, the rest of this chapter, the rest of these verses. This ordinary world was really the stage for which God sends his son, though, in that extraordinary way. And I want you to see that the hope of your life and my life is found in between the ordinary circumstances of our life and the extraordinary touch of God. We could even say it this way, that the hope of our hearts really is found between the natural realm of our lives and then the supernatural touch of God. Listen, you and I cannot experience faith without believing in God's power to do anything. It's the impossibilities of God from which he has committed himself to be able to intervene and save and touch and change hearts and change lives. If we didn't believe that, there would be no reason for us to get out of bed this morning. But because he has come, we know that there is a reason to believe, not only has he changed my heart, but he longs to have a personal relationship with every single person that he has ever created. Notice what the Bible says in verse 20. After he had considered this, an angel Lord appeared to him in a dream. Why did God do that? A couple things. Dreams and angels were supernatural occurrences by which God would confirm what he was doing. I think if you're going to tell a man, he's engaged to a woman, uh, that somehow she's pregnant, she's never been with anyone else, that you need a whole lot of backup and confirmation in that. Joseph would have been glad to have received this. Here's Joseph. He's receiving the news. The Bible even says all this takes place to fulfill what the prophet has said. What was the prophet? You read back, you go back, and you find all through the Old Testament, all through Isaiah, that God was going to bring this baby, this perfect son, Messiah, in the way that he did. Now, the people didn't see it in that way at that time because they couldn't conceive God was going to do something so miraculous. We couldn't have made this up on our own, but God did. He conceived of it from the beginning of time, and in perfect real time, he brings it to pass. But the thing that astounds me as I read this and I think about it is this phrase. I want you to write this down, the incarnation. You have it in your guide. Because that's really the bulk of what this passage teaches us about God. What does the incarnation mean? Uh, we don't just use that word and throw it around, but we have to know what it means. It's a Latin phrase which means in the flesh. Literally, the incarnation is God in the flesh. Why is that important? Because if you don't believe in God in the flesh, you can err. And if you take either one of these aspects of who Jesus is in this moment, you lose the ability then to understand what the cross is all about. You see, Jesus is not 50% man and 50% God. He's 100% God and he is 100% man. Think of that. 
He's at the same time perfectly deity, perfectly God incarnate, but he also is human. We struggle with this. The Greeks struggled with the idea that God could even be touched by the material world, and so they denied that Jesus was really God. They denied the deity. I think about us today, do you know what I think we have trouble with? By faith, we believe, if you're like me, that God is 100% God. Jesus is 100% God as a baby. But we struggle with his humanity. I mean, we sing songs in which we don't even let the little baby Jesus cry. Away in a manger. We think about that song. It's beautiful. It's good. I'm not saying we should throw a flag down and stop singing it, please. I'm not saying it's heretical. I'm just saying whoever wrote that probably didn't have a lot of kids. All right, that's all I'm saying. (laughs) The little Lord Jesus, no crying he makes. What's wrong with the crying Jesus? I mean, do we really think that the first Christmas Jesus was there and never cooed, never made a sound, didn't need to be changed? Come on. You say, but that doesn't sound appropriate. It was God's idea. Perfect, sinless. This is the beauty of the incarnation. God in flesh. This little baby held by earthly parents who looked at him with every hope and dream not understanding it all from the beginning. We sing another Christmas classic, Mary, Did You Know? Don't go touching that song. I love that. But Mary knew in a lot of ways, but then on the other hand, she didn't know. Gabriel told her, you are going to give birth to the Messiah, but yet how could she ever have known all of what that would mean? In a very human way, God comes to us. I thought, could you imagine being the half-brothers of Jesus? You imagine James, he's a teenager. All of a sudden, he's had it with Joseph and Mary, and he starts talking back to them. Remember, he probably did. James had a sin nature. Jesus didn't. I could see see James saying uh, to his dad, Dad, you all never treat Jesus like this. You think he's perfect. Hey, I could see Joseph doing this. Well, he kind of is. We're a little ashamed too, son. I want you to think about this. Christmas means because of God in the flesh. Watch this. Write this down. Number one, God is with us. The Bible says that Joseph and Mary are receiving all of these divine clues that God is up to something according to the scriptures through all of the confirmation of the angels Perhaps it was Gabriel that spoke to Joseph. We know it was Gabriel that spoke to Mary, but it was an angel. And that phrase of verse 21, he will save his people from from their sins. How? Because God would be with us. You ought to highlight and circle verse 23. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him what? Emmanuel, which means God with us. That is the incarnation. Taken from the pages of the Old Testament. In one way, the people of God completely missed this, listen, because of the hardness of their heart and their sinfulness. That's the very thing that still causes us to miss Christmas. My sinfulness, my brokenness, it is a me problem. It's not a world problem. It's not a consumerism problem. It is a heart-to-heart before God issue. Nobody can talk us out of Christmas or celebrating Christmas when as believers we believe that God sent his son. All of history divided, B.C. and A.D. We think about the fact that Jesus came. That's a historical reality. The question is, do we believe in his claims? And as believers, we most certainly do. But when I pause and think about this, I think about several things. Number one, because he is the God-man in the incarnation, he never sinned. You say, well, if he never sinned, how can we relate to him? Because the Bible says he is the perfect fulfillment of a prophet, priest, and king in the Old Testament. That through Abraham, God would bless what? The nations. Who is from the seed of Abraham ultimately? Jesus. Watch this. And through the throne of David, this little baby was not just a baby, but he was a king. He was a king who will rightly rule over everybody in the earth. One day the Bible teaches us that every tongue will profess that he is Christ and every knee will bow. And when you read this passage, you get this awesome sense 
that God wasn't just doing this in the dark, although that seemed to be the case from his people's perspective, that he was doing it in the bright light of everything, and publicly and privately, everything was perfect about Jesus, but yet he was tempted. The Bible says he was tempted. You go over to Matthew 4, he begins his public ministry. What happens? 40 days there. He goes through a season of tempting. So many ways that all would have been lost or gained in that moment in the desert if Jesus would have given in to any one of those temptations. But you see, his heart had already been settled. I think about this. At what age was Jesus when he really put it together that the Messiah he was reading about was him? That here he was, the one that would come. And then to be subjected to all the pain and the hurts, yes, that's our Jesus. I love that in the Gospels, Jesus was so ordinary. That's why people missed him. But he was extraordinary in that he had the power of God on his life. He was God. He touched people. And whenever he touched people, the sickness had to flee. When Jesus ministered, he had time for children. He had time for the elderly. He had time for the down and out. People who were just out of hope, who were ostracized. Whether it was the leper or the woman with the issue of blood. Jesus was there and he radically changed people's lives. He was so ordinary, but he was extraordinary. God with us. That's what John writes about in John 1.14 when he says this, that the light has come into the world. It says that he is the hope of the world. He has come and he tabernacled among us. He made his dwelling. That idea of tabernacle conjures up the glory of God that would be within the tabernacle of the Old Testament. And the people of God knew when they followed the Lord, they would follow at a distance, but they would keep their eyes fastened upon the glory that was represented in the tabernacle. The New Testament says this, though, that God has come to us. He has taken the place. He has taken the confines of a physical human body. And so the tabernacle was beheld by us because he was a living, breathing person. And much more than that, Christmas means not only then that God is with us, write this other part down, because if we miss this, we miss it all. God is in us. He never sinned, although he was tempted. He felt all of our pain. He subjected himself to the brokenness of a world that he created. He was put on the cross and died for the world that he would by faith redeem. That's our Lord. All of this beginning in an ordinary way from this family but yet extraordinary because God's hand was on his life. No wonder the Apostle Paul says this. This is the hope of glory, Christ in you. What a phrase that is. To think, church family, that not only is God here, and that's a historic fact, that in and of itself makes us pause, but the reason we celebrate and have joy is because the Lord is within us. Talked to a believer this week who's going through an awful time uh, I hadn't seen him tear up before, and he teared up. We were talking, sharing, going through some things in his life. and He just says it's hard. I'm going to tell you, he loves the Lord. Christ is in him. Watch this. And because of that, he's going to walk through the pain, but he's going to be able to walk through the pain. There's meaning and significance in it. He says, it's hard, Philip. I said, I can only imagine. But you know who can do more than imagining? You know who sympathizes with us as a high priest? Jesus. He knows it. He knows every single part of it. The church family, I think about us on this day of dedication. Let me say this again, what we all believe. As we're getting ready for today, I thought about all the people who were here today. I had a lady who's been sick in and out of the hospital. I looked around this morning. Here she was standing. You know, I love that generation. Well, if I'm going to be sick, I'm going to be sick at the home in the living room. Or I could be sick here at church. Might as well come to church. Amen. I love that. Might as well be here. Here she is. I thought, man, Lord, there are a lot of people who come here today. Uh, Makes you a little nervous when you're a teacher. Let me just tell you, I thought about Pastor Billy Friel's letter. He's going to be with us in spirit. He won't be here physically, but that's a little nerve-wracking. My dear, precious people. He's only been here for 30 years. A little love. Philip, don't mess this one up. Pastor Mark and Jan said they're going to be here this weekend. I thought, come on, now now the stakes are getting higher. They're going to be here. You know what the Lord put in my heart? Literally. 
The only thing that we can offer people is the only thing we've ever been able to offer people. God is with us. That's who's here. He's not only with us, he is in us. And if you could take your pain and orient yourself to the purposes and promises of God, it makes all the difference. I love that President Bush's funeral, there was a Senator Simpson. Uh, you ought to YouTube it. Eight minutes of just glorious eulogy about H.W. Bush. But here's a line. He said, in his hardest moment in uh, the Senate and in politics, he said, I, I felt like President Bush's popularity was, 0.9, was 9, 97%. Mine was like 0.97%. He said, but the president called me. He goes, I didn't really know what he was doing until after he was doing it, that everywhere he went for a weekend, special retreat, camp day, he was able to be there with the president. They went to a special singing. There he was with the president. He was just with him, a person of access and privilege and prominence. And he said, I finally said to him, Mr. President, I know what you're doing. You're just trying to help an old friend out who's kind of having a hard time right now in the media and politics, and you just want to be with me. He said, that's exactly what I'm trying to do. Isn't it amazing how simple the power of the presence of of our lives is and our families and our relationships and how much more in the presence of God. So we go to prayer. Here's what I want to put in your heart, church family. There was a man who was a good man. He did not believe in the incarnation. Uh, yes, he was hopeful. He wasn't against religion, but he did not believe that God could become a man. And so at Christmas Eve, his wife wanted him to come. But this good man said, Honey, you know, I can't bring myself to believe that. God would become a man. But I don't want to interfere. You go and you enjoy the Christmas service, and I'm going to stay here at the house. Well, it was a late night. They went to a midnight service. And as he began to go back into the house, saw their car leave the drive, he heard a thump on his window. He no sooner sat down in the living room and he thought, I wonder if that's like somebody throwing a snowball in my window. But it kept happening. Thump. So he went out and he saw that there were some birds that were flying through. And it hit his nice landscape window. And as he saw them, he had a little pity on them. And he thought, you know, I need to help these birds who are flying through here. So he had a nice old barn that he just put his coat on. He trudged through the snow that was falling down. And he just opened up the door. And he thought, if I could just open the door, then the birds will come in. But they didn't come in. He turned the light on in the barn, and he thought, if I could just turn the light on, they will see the light. Those old birds will come in. He got a little frustrated because they wouldn't come in. They were afraid of him. They didn't know him. They paid him no mind. Well, he thought, well, I'm going to get a little bread. He got some bread. He just tried to make a little trail so the birds would, would be attracted to that bread and come into the barn, but they would not come. He even felt desperate. He goes out there in the snow, him by himself, these birds flying around, and he's shooing them, come to the barn, come to the barn. And they did not go into the barn. And he just said to himself, I just wish I could talk to those birds. If I could just mingle with them, if I could only speak their language, I could help point the way. I could help them into that barn. But he could not because they were afraid of him. But he said, if I could only be one of them, they would not be afraid of me, and I could help them. And at that moment, he heard the Christmas Eve bell ring down at the church. And that man who said, I can't believe the incarnation, was struck with the Spirit of the Lord, who spoke to his heart, said, that's exactly why God became man, like us, our creator, to redeem us so that we could have the forgiveness of our sin and a new heart and a new life and be in his family. Would you pray with me with your heads bowed, your eyes closed? Church family, there is a simplicity to all of this that just requires a childlike response. No matter how long we've been a believer, the question is, are we still, are we still hopeful in the things of God? What happens to every one of us is this, that life can beat us up. It can be disillusioning. People can disappoint us. We have problems around us, those that we love. 
And yet the Christmas message is still as good today as it was then. It's still as true now as forever will be in eternity. God with us. He is not just here in an atmosphere. He wants to be at home in our hearts. And if you're a believer, would you take a moment and from your heart to God's heart as we remind ourselves of this rededication service, God wants us to completely serve Him, to love Him with all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our mind, and all of our strength. Would you pray that as a believer? 